now we got to talk about uh, another. Honestly, man, we're going to get into Vlad in a future segment. Yeah. But I really don't see much of a difference between Vlad and Michael Rubin personally. But Michael Rubin got into some social media internet hot water because he made a controversial statement while being a guest on The Breakfast Club, basically talking about how he's noticed that when it comes to Black culture, uh, it, it, it's popular or prominent for Black people to hate on one another. Oh. Uh, and he said it, in his opinion, he was being, in a, he had his intentions behind saying it. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it did not go over well. A lot of people felt it is not his place to speak on it. And so he had to issue a retread. But he initially got into hot water for his for his statements in the first place. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see if we can. So, OK, so here is initially what he said. So this says Michael Rubin catches serious flack for revealing what he dislikes about black culture. Uh-oh. Michael Rubin is someone who is in close proximity to black culture. Overall, the. Fanatics entrepreneur has friends, uh, has friendships with the likes of Meek Mill, Jay Z, Drake, and many other artists in the hip hop world. Throughout the years, some have questioned his this proximity and his intentions. However, Ruben continues to be defended by those who know him best. Not to mention, the who's who of entertainment can be found at his yearly white party, with the latest outing being the biggest yet. Recently, however, Michael Ruben found himself in a bit of a controversy, as it's all his own doing. The entrepreneur was on The Breakfast Club where he offered up some comments about what he dislikes about black culture. As you can see below, Ruben said that he doesn't like when black people hate on other black people. He subsequently used some of the backlash against Meat Mill as an example of this. However, many didn't appreciate just how comfortable he was with making these comments. Uh, So let me go ahead and play what he had to say here. Uh, This is from an Instagram clip posted to the neighborhood talk of the thing that got him uh, in some, you know, social media hot water with a lot of people. Hmm. The thing I don't like about that is it doesn't bother me for me. It bothers me that it actually, when I see the narrative of a really good friend of mine, like Meek and people trying to, you know, Again, if he was gay, which there's not one gay bone in his body, who cares? Number one, let's say if people want to be gay in 2024, who the fuck cares? Mm-hmm. Okay. Number two, there's not a gay bone in his body. So, like, why do people want to lie about that? Why do people want to change a narrative of bet he made with me mm-hmm. to try to hurt him? Like, that is the one thing I've learned about, you know, look, I'm just being blunt because it's me. So, one thing I've learned about black culture that I don't like is that black hate on hate. Speak on that more. I heard you say that earlier and I wanted you to expound on that. You said you don't like to see black people tearing down other black people. Yeah, it's horrible. Like, like it's horrible. Like, what? Like, I want to support every, look, you got, two of you guys know me pretty well. Mm -hmm. Anything I can ever help with, I'm always there. Mm -hmm. I always want to be helpful. I feel lucky and fortunate to do what I do every day to be as, you know, whatever success I've had, I feel blessed to do that. And I want to give back in every way I can, you know, in business and in charitable things, I'm always trying to be helpful. Like, why does someone want to bring somebody else down? Let's try to build everybody up. Like, you know, I, I, I'd be more excited if, you know, if I'd be more excited to see one of my friends do something that's 99% less meaningful to me, but it would be really meaningful to them because I want them to do great. I want everyone around mm-hmm. me to do great. Mm-hmm. I don't like watching, you know, there's a little bit, and you tell me, you guys correct me if you think I'm wrong. I think there's a little bit of a black culture of like, it's black hate on hate. It's like that black judge that Meek had that hated on him and want to put in, go extra hard on him. Okay. It's like, I like, it's what people always say to me. It's like black hate on hate. So I think it's terrible. Um, I think it's something that it's, I think it's culturally wrong. And I, I'll probably get killed for saying this because you know, you're, you know, I'm glad you're guy. saying it openly. If this yeah. is the conversations that are being I have had it all the time. With almost, that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I want to hear this. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's wrong. I think like, why do you not want to build everyone up around you? Why do you not want everyone around you to do great? The best way for, everyone to do great is to push each other up okay all right and so let me see if there are some of the reactions to what he had to say um so here are some of the people who reacted here why is michael rubin on the breakfast club talking about black culture specifically black hate and charlem gay asking him 
to expound on his thoughts. I effing hate some of y'all, man. Laughing my ass off. I'm so dead ass. Uh, here's another response. Michael Rubin being allowed to infiltrate by his way into black hip hop culture is nasty work and is extra nasty because the man who once said we need a board when it comes to the culture is one of his BFFs now. That person he's referring to is obviously Jay-Z. Uh, uh, says Michael Rubin, whose culture and community does nothing but tear down freedmen, FKA black Americans. A culture vulture has the audacity to speak on freedmen, FKA black culture, why isn't he speaking about his community? Why isn't he speaking about how his community tears one another down? Because they do. Um, I think it's weird that Mike Rubin is saying there is a lot of black on black hate and black culture in defense of Meek Mill, but didn't Meek Mill say on stage with Robert Kraft present and said that he's paid more to talk about ignorant stuff? Uh, why should we give a damn about what Mike Rubin has to say about black culture? So that's some of the response that people had on social media. Um, since then, uh, Ruben has kind of walked a little bit of his back. Uh, he issued something on Twitter where he said, I got a phone call from one of the people I have the most respect for in the world. They told me while they appreciate my intention, it's not my place to speak on black culture. I get it and really appreciate the input. My, intent, my intention was to say how important it is that we need to uplift each other, stop hate on each other, and push each other to win, and always root for each other's success. My bad, much love, my bad, much love, and appreciate the feedback. So that was him kind of trying to qualify where he was coming from with those comments on The Breakfast Club. So I am interested to get into this, uh, to hear what you have to say about this, but what do you make of what Michael Rubin said there? First of all, I agree with the, the backlash. Um, you know, if, if I commented online about stuff like this, uh, I would have been saying the same things. Uh, and I'm about to double, triple down here. Uh, here, here, my thing is, the main thing that I agree with was was the one was like, hey, you know, your community does that too. By the way, everybody's community does it. So for him to hop in on a black radio show and to come in and start telling black people about what they doing wrong, uh, you know, in the fashion that he's doing it, uh the first thing that was popping in my brain was, you know, wow, they really think we're, we're stupid. They, they, I think they really think that we're just all dumb and they can just do or say anything and they'll eat it up. I don't know what his, he went in there with that talking point. He was going to get that off his chest. He was like, I'm on a breakfast club. I'm about to say this to y'all black people. And one thing, one thing that, one thing that, people like him do is that they try to perform an inception on people and uh and in the inception movie <clears throat> you know when uh they was des describing how inception works to leonardo dicaprio and it was like uh you know pink elephants you know don't think about pink elephants he's a like, well yeah I'm a, you know you're gonna start thinking about pink elephants because i said pink elephants but if I gave you pretty much like a seed of something that leads to that, then you would automatically think that's a thought of your own. And what what uh, Mr. Rubin here is doing and, and other propaganda things that are done is that they uh, they they give these seeds out, you know, on their media platforms. And so with this radio show, he decided to come in and. Uh, sow a seed uh, so the people could believe it and eat it up and be like, you know what? We do hate on our own people. Nothing but crabs in a barrel. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what's the other stuff that they say? Uh, Self-hate. Uh, you know, if you, have criti if you have criticism of a black person uh, for doing something that you don't care for and you feel like they should have more honor and integrity doing it and you just calling them out on principle, that's not crabs in a barrel, but we've been conditioned to believe that 
you know, trying to self-correct within our community is hate. And it's not. And it's that same, it's that same stuff where you can't criticize nothing. You can't say nothing to nobody. Everybody's so sensitive. So no, man, if there's, if there's a, a black director that is constantly making movies and films and stuff like that, that, that deals with the traumas of our people and is constantly pumping that. He had all the resources in the world to do something else, but he's still doing the same damn thing. I'm going to call that out. And be, by me calling that out, that's not me being a hater. And here's the other thing that they say. Hey, he's getting money. He's getting money. I hate See, that. You, try, you trying to stop him from getting his money? He got more money than you. As I if, hate yeah. yeah, as if having money is having life figured out. Hey, man. Y'all seen some of these people that be on TMZ all the time? These people are supposed to have all the money in the world. These are the messiest people in the world. So do they have it all figured out because they got money? I don't think so. So money doesn't equate to wisdom or anything. And especially in today's day and age when you're the narcissist and that's what gets you on. If you got a lot of money and you're in the public eye, for the most part, people will have to start questioning your integrity and who you are as a person. Because the only people that make it to the top, honestly, are the people that we keep seeing having allegations. <laughs> so Mr. Rubin here wants to sit here and talk about there's not a gay bone in his body. I did I beg the difference. In Meek Mill's body. I beg the difference. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty sure Mr. Rubin put his bone in uh Mr. Meek Mill. Especially after he had him bunny hopping on the tennis court. How disrespectful was that? This is the last thing I'll say before I let you go. How disrespectful was that towards our community? One of our best and our brightest, you would say? That's what you would say, Mr. Rubin. He's one of our best and our brightest. You know? So much so that a judge would try to tear him down. Right? So one of the best and the brightest of our community, you would sit there and demand for him to bunny hop. For, for, for the world to see and then post it online. Then, when, when the community was calling our best and our brightest under question, you know, about all these weird hugs at this white, all white party. All right. You said, you said on the plane, you recorded another video. I said, I'm gonna give you and little baby a, an aggressive hug tonight. <laughs> I don't want to hear this, Mr. Rubin. I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. So I can go on a lot longer, but sir, I'll let you speak and have the floor. What do you feel? And how, what are your thoughts on Sir Rubin uh, getting on a breakfast club saying that black people, uh, tear each other down too much. Uh, what are your thoughts? I agree with all of the people who came out and denounced it. Mm -hmm. And I wish that, because Ruben isn't the only one who does this. I just wish that every other person who does this also gets called out to the same magnitude that he did. Yeah. Uh, I agree with the backlash as well, mm -hmm. but I also understand why he felt comfortable enough speaking in this manner. <laughs> so we have to keep, we have to remember something. So the, 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 the issue in question is his audaciousness towards feeling comfortable enough to speak <laughs> on black culture yeah. despite the fact that he is not a part of black culture and this is what i will say to that what see so you, you you really have to pick and parse the words here to understand the pathology behind a person's decisions what is culture more specifically what is black culture keep in mind he made these comments in relation, in reference to his relationship to a rapper, in this case, Meek Mill. Now, if anyone, if anyone who is, if there's anyone who is checking us out right now or who's watching this video and you're familiar with the general way that we like to do things on this channel, you are well aware of the many videos that we have published to this channel speaking specifically on the juxtaposition of black culture in relation to hip hop. Furthermore, you all furthermore, you also know how uncomfortable I am with the notion that black culture is synonymous with hip hop. You speak on inception. The idea that black culture and, and hip hop are synonymous is perhaps one of the most immaculate cultural inceptions of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. This idea that your culture, this group of people's way of life is directly tethered to this music form. Therefore, if you if you want to learn everything there is there is to know about these people, don't actually interact with them, interface with them, learn about the history. Um, 
you know, live in the same neighborhoods with them, respect them for decency, just put on this music and listen to it. Now, you and I and others who know better understand that that's not true. Mm -hmm. But the world at large, I think the global community, as well as the community in this country who does not directly interact with people who do not look like them on a regular enough basis, do glean what it means to be black, basically from listening to this music and paying attention to what the proprietors of this music do publicly outside of the musical context with respect to what they do on social media, so on and so forth. So the idea is black culture is hip hop and hip hop is black culture. The two are deeply intertwined and therefore synonymous. Mm -hmm. The reason why an individual like him can be so comfortable speaking on black culture is because due to the fact that hip hop is black culture and hip hop itself has been commodified and sold to the world as a product to be consumed by everybody. People who are invested in making money off of it then become a part of the culture. So in a roundabout way, whether you like it or not, and I do say this, uh, I do say this like cynically, sarcastically, facetiously even, but in a roundabout way, Michael Rubin is a part of black culture. Yeah. Am I happy with that? No, but he is just like Robert Kraft is just like Vlad is. These people are black culture. They're a part of it. You know why they're a part of it? Because hip hop is black culture and they're heavily invested in profiteering off of hip hop. Now, if we wanted to draw a clear line in the sand and make it understood that there is a delineation between our actual culture and the music thereby making it very clear that the music might be an offshoot of one of our cultural exports, but it is not necessarily representative of our culture in its entirety, that would be a different story. But that's not what we've accepted. What we've accepted is our culture is the music and is the culture that surrounds the music directly. And since this music is consumed by everybody worldwide, if you take part in the consumption of it, you therefore take part in the culture of the people who make it for the most part. Mm -hmm. So Ruben is black culture. He is. And for anybody out there who doesn't like me saying that, don't get mad at me. I'm just reporting the news. I don't like it just as much as you do. I'm I am just as much. I am just as much not a fan of this as you are listening to it. I don't like it, but he is a part of black culture. Therefore, he does have a license to speak in this manner. Now, that ain't good, and I'm not a fan of it, but it is what it is. See, you know, and again, I guess I'm going to repeat myself, but it is what it is. We did ourselves a grave disservice by allowing the uh, collaborative effort between corporations and the music industry to sell us on the idea that that is our culture. And we gave up our rights to defend against that idea when we said we will allow you to sell this as culture to the world so long as you make us rich in the process. That's all that people like Michael Rubin are doing, brokering deals with people like Jay-Z and Meek Mill and Rick Ross and Lil Baby. For what? You, you, think, you think he's doing this out of the goodness of his heart? He's making money off of this. Because hip hop is a money making machine more so than it is an actual representation of a group of people, even though it's positioned that way. And since he is actively a part of this money making machine, he can't speak in that way. Now, the backlash is understandable. It is. The backlash is understandable. And I agree with the backlash. But the impetus for him feeling comfortable enough to speak on that, oh, I know exactly where it comes from. He's a part of hip hop. In a roundabout way, second-handedly, he's a part of hip-hop. And since hip-hop and black culture are one and the same, he therefore is, by process of elimination, a part of black culture. Therefore, he can speak like this. The way that he sees it, he is a member of the culture critiquing the culture on how to be better. That's the way he sees it in his mind. So he's going to walk it back because he sees that it pissed a lot of people off. But I bet you if you get him in a room and y'all are having a private conversation about this, he feels well within his right to chastise the way black people treat one another because he feels as though he is a part of the tapestry that is black culture. 
once again, not the actual culture of Black uh, Americans of African descent, but the commercialized form of culture that's been shoved down people's throats, which is hip hop. So I get why he felt that way. I don't like it, but it is what it is. And if you want people like him to not feel as though they can speak in this manner so freely, we are going to need to do a much better job of detaching ourselves from the idea that we own this music as a form of culture because it is not, and quite frankly, it never has been. Hey man, 1,000, dog. And, um, and I also say that me personally, I just feel as though um, Mr. Rubin here is uh, a plant uh, he's a plant I, I, I you know people could you know point out his uh his meteoric rise but um and his involvement how he got into all of this but you know everybody's got a story of how they made it you know there's an ice spice story out there somewhere of how she made her meteoric rise so just because you have a meteoric rise doesn't mean it was an authentic one i'll just say that and so my thing is with Mr. Rubin, Vlad, and the other people that, as you mentioned, that are the people who call them, uh, you know, vultures, culture vultures and all that other stuff. But, um, yeah, I look at these people as gatekeepers in a way, uh, boundary people uh, to keep people in a, 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 a silo of thought. So, he, he, so he, here's my thing. If somebody out here really subscribes to the notion of crabs in a bucket, crabs in a barrel, however you want to uh, give the analogy. All right. Well, my question to you is, well, what's this condition of the bucket? Who put these crabs in the bucket? And so as you were talking about where well, you were talking about hip hop and the industrial form of it, that these labels and other things. Uh, have been doing that is in this context the condition of the bucket that is the bucket and then all of these rappers or entertainers that are in this field that are trying to make it to the top they there's other people in there that feel this scarcity si situation going on and they feel as though if I don't make it then you know nobody is so the crab in a barrel mentality uh, takes on its form but my thing is, who are the people, who are the people that are putting these conditions together? And as you mentioned, these conditions that these industries and these people have created is called this, this bucket is called hip hop. And who's keeping this commercialized form of hip hop? We're not talking authentic hip hop. We're talking about the rap, the co-opted one. And this, this co-opted bucket is is uh held in structure by people like ruben so his all white parties and all his other rituals that he does is all a part of making sure that the people uh stay in their hero worship and their idol worship of these weirdos and you know the black uh fraternities whether they're athletes rappers or any form of entertainment or whatever they get invited to these functions and so while they're getting invited to these functions, they're letting the world know their allegiance and their alliance. You see, these these athletes, rappers and entertainers, especially these basketball players that are making, you know, buku dumb money. Imagine if these guys, when they, when they got together, instead of just dressing in all white and being on a yacht, uh, getting bareback hugs from uh, Ruben. <laughs> all right. Imagine if they actually use that to actually create an infrastructure for our people that is our own situation, our, our own what bucket, if you will, but not a bucket of scarcity where people have to pull themselves down, a bucket of upward mobility. But that's not what we that's not what we're getting. So much like how fraternities do and uh, historically black colleges or anywhere else for that matter the best and the brightest in air quotes, I say that really in air quotes, the best and the brightest of our people, because if, honestly, if there was our best and our brightest, they wouldn't join those things. But the best and the brightest of our people in air quotes, join these things in order to, after they leave the fraternity, to come in our communities and say that they're doing work, but they're just doing community service. They're not using their intellect, their connections and stuff like that to uplift the community they do that to uplift themselves and while they uplift themselves and they got another black person 
into that fraternal order or whatever, they then get a job doing something where else, where again, they're creating this, they're keeping the conditions of the bad bucket alive. So just like how they do in universities and stuff like that, they do that with athletes and entertainers. And Michael Rubin is one of the, the, the ringleaders of that circus. So that's why when he calls his all white party and he's telling Meek Mill to bunny hop on command, this is his, and I'm going to give you a, a naked hug tonight, Mr. Little Baby. Whenever he's saying, well, yeah, whenever he's saying these things, that's because he's in a position of th an authority over these people because his money talks for them. And so he is so bold that he got on Breakfast Club and thought everybody in our community was as dumb as those rappers. I'm here to tell you, Mr. Rubin, not all of us are idiots and not all of us are going for it. Yeah, I see clips of Breakfast, Breakfast Club floating online. I don't watch it or listen to these clowns. All right. And so the, the people out there that do listen to those uh, those morons in the morning, um, you know, I, I wish those people the best. But not everybody thinks like that, Mr. Rubin. So I'll just tell you like that, man, he can go kick rocks, um, you know, and, um, you know, it, I'm not saying that a, a white man uh, can't speak on, uh, you know, other cultures or and have something to say. But that was real bold. It was something about that that was just real distasteful. And like you said, the audacity for you to get up there and just talk like that, like like you can go to a Mexican place and talk about a Mexican stereotype. You know what I don't like about Mexicans? You can't say that. <laughs> go to an LGBT uh, friendly thing. You know what I don't like about the gays? You can't say that. So why do you feel so bold to do that for, for the African-American community? Like I said, I think he got so bold uh, whipping around those uh, celebrities that he think that everybody uh, go for that dumb stuff. So, uh, yeah, get out of here, Mr. Rubin. Not buying it. Breakfast Club, you guys fail again. Boy, it only took Charlemagne a week. But even then, Charlemagne didn't even agree with this. He was just like, hey, man, I wanted to bring you on there to clarify that. But still, this is a goofy show. Breakfast Club, y'all can kick rocks. My bad, bro. I had to get that out my chest. <laughs> no, I, 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 I feel you. I just, I think the reason why he was, you know, bold, audacity. And, and let me say one other thing real quick, because, you mm -hmm. know, I, I brought up, you know, the music again. Mm -hmm. You know, people are going to say, well, real hip hop isn't like that. I know that there is a difference. OK, yes. I we recognize that there is a, a, a delineation between yeah. actual hip hop in its most pure form and yes. what we would call rap music today. Right. The issue with it is it has all coalesced into a general it's a blob. It's all been for, it's all been coalesced into one giant blob and called hip hop. So this goofy music is now masquerading as hip hop. We Correct. know that there is a difference, but that is what it is called. Correct. So we get that there is a difference. And the reason why he feels comfortable enough speaking in this way is because in his heart of hearts, and I believe this, he believes he is a part of said culture. He believes he's yeah. a part of that. Yeah. He believes. See, people are mad at him because they look at him on the outside and they say, you're not a part of this culture. So how can you feel so comfortable speaking in this way? He is probably saying to himself, why are they getting upset with me? I'm one of you. I'm speaking like this because I'm a part of your culture. I'm one of you and I'm trying, <laughs> and I'm trying to help you. I'm dead serious. I'm dead ass. Yeah, yeah. He's probably saying to himself, I'm one of you and I'm trying to help you. Why are you rejecting the help that I'm trying to give you? And, and the problem with all of this is him feeling like this is built upon a fallacy of a foundation that is rooted in something that he is a part of that has been masquerading as culture that isn't actually culture. And we can throw this word around all day, every day, and you can dismiss it as not being so important, but it is. Words matter. Words matter. And the, 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 the music and the ecosystem around the music and the people who are a part of making it both behind the scenes and in front of the microphone have all been complicit in the perpetuation of the idea that the music and the environment surrounding it represents this group of people. Mm -hmm. So if you are a part of the consumption of that music, you therefore can be a part of that culture itself. It's a slick Jedi mind trick 
This is why somebody like 50 Cent can publicly say his power shows authentically represent Black and Latino no. communities. No. No. That's why he, <laughs> that's why he can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we drink that Kool Aid, why wouldn't somebody like Ruben drink it? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And and furthermore, if people like him do business with someone like Ruben, what what why wouldn't he feel as though he is well within his right to say that? So once again, I'm not in and of itself defending him. I'm kind of being chide and 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 cynical. And I hope people are understanding the point that I'm trying to make with this. He is a part of the culture. Therefore, that is why he can speak that way. But there's a problem with the fact that he is a part of the culture. And we therefore have to dissect what does it even mean to be part of the quote unquote culture? That's where the rubber meets the road with this whole thing. Um, and until we take that power back, which I don't think we ever will because there's too much money to be made in the perpetuation of the idea that that is the culture, then these infiltrators will continue to speak comfortably on it because why not? They're a part of it. They're one of us. Ruben is on our side of the fence, just like Kraft and Vlad and the rest of these people. There are some others that I can think of, but those are the ones that come immediately to mind because they have profited the most off of it, from what I can tell. Um, But I completely get it. And if you don't like it, I think that I think you need to be a part of the conversation that further examines what black culture even means, because that's the crux of the argument. Yeah, man. And um, so all all these um, all white party attendees, you know, uh, you know, James Harden, uh, Kyle Kuzma, uh, you know, they're out here wearing their assless chaps on a boat. (laughs) (laughs) Man. You know what I'm saying? That y'all can have at it, man. But the further y'all go down that road, the further you guys are separating yourselves from the people, and the people can see y'all. Uh, this is not this is not 2004. This is not 1995. Uh, there's a lot of information online, and there's a lot of people out there that know exactly what these clowns are up to. So, um, yeah, we're not buying it here. I know I'm not buying it for sure. All right. And uh, and yeah, as you mentioned, this guy feels like he's a part of the fabric of yes. the community because he can chop it up with yeah. uh, Meek Mill. So, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, have at it, man. So um, provide more good content, Mr. Ruben, because I know he's going to he's going to do more uh, yeah. because he's a part of our community, apparently. So, yes, he uh, is. He, he's self-invited to the cookout. He's, he, yeah. he, came to, he came to the cookout telling us the mac and cheese don't taste right. Listen to this right. guy. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, get out of here. Nobody want yeah. that creamy stovetop mac you, you talking about, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said, he's sitting down at the table telling us a better way to make potato salad. That's what he's doing. <laughs> talking about, talking about to put raisins in it. Boy, get out, <laughs> my, get out of my kitchen. <laughs> get out of my kitchen. Yeah. Um, I'm not buying it, man. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But um, at this point, our culture doesn't even exist. And since it doesn't exist, it isn't real. When something isn't real, it can be filled of all types of imposters. So, you know, until it is made whole, we will have to be, we will have to learn how to coexist with the imposters. Facts. 100.